Well, this morning, let's, uh, let's just bow before the Lord in prayer before I open the word today. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the privilege that we have in a free country to gather together and to, and to look at what you have to say to us through your word. God, we bless you this morning. We come here to worship you, Jesus, and we thank you for being our Savior. And Lord, as we open the word today, I pray, God, that you would give me the words to say that would would just hit the right marks for, for the people that you love so dearly that are here this morning. And God, we just pray for your anointing spirit to rest upon everything that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we're continuing on in the, uh, the book of John in chapter 12. In context with what was taking place in Jesus' ministry on the earth, um, Getting into what we're going to talk about today, we see that Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead, and I mentioned this last week, how he had been dead in the tomb for four days, and Jesus raised him from the dead. And uh, this caused more than just a little stir, and more than just a little bit of interest from the people that were in the area at the time, Jesus... uh, name was going throughout the community and they're like did you hear what happened because there were so many eyewitnesses to this um it was undeniable that a tremendous miracle had occurred had occurred and all the people in the area heard about it and the pharisees and the sadducees and the chief priests i guess you call the sadducees the chief priests they were alarmed by jesus popularity And they wanted to have him killed. And we talked last week about how the hardness of their heart made them blind to the fact that they were actually wanting to have uh, God in the flesh put to death because he didn't fit their agenda. But as it was not yet time for Jesus to go to the cross, the Lord and his disciples, they withdrew from Bethsaida, Bethesda, sorry, a town just outside of Jerusalem, and they went to this town called Ephraim, which was between Jerusalem and Jericho. So they hid in that town because it wasn't time for Jesus yet to go to the cross. So after staying there for a while, we see as the Passover season approached, Jesus and his disciples came out of hiding and attended a special feast in Bethesda, And the feast was held in honor of Jesus for raising Lazarus from the dead. So Mary and Martha were hosting it. And their brother Lazarus was part of this feast. There was a big feast there. And when word got out that Jesus was there and that this feast was taking place, people started coming to see Jesus. Large crowds of people came to where Jesus was staying. And this even raised the alarm of these religious leaders that were trying to get rid of Jesus, it raised it further. They were driven by selfish motivation to preserve their own structures of power and authority in Israel. And they were distressed because of the threat that Jesus posed to overturn their comfortable way of living. And such a large crowd gathered around Jesus that they were fearing that it might draw the attention of the Romans and cause political trouble for them. Therefore, in the hardness of their heart, they sought even further to make a plan on how they might get rid of Jesus, but they also thought that they needed to get rid of Lazarus too, because Lazarus was the evidence of the power of Jesus. And that was, this is where we pick up today in John chapter 12, verse 12. But before we get into our text this morning in John chapter 12, verse 12 to 50, I want to direct your attention towards an ancient prophecy given by the prophet Zechariah. Because in the life of Jesus, a lot of what he did and a lot of how things came about was actually prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus' birth. 
This ancient prophecy by the prophet Zechariah in Zechariah 9, 9 to 11, I'd like to read it for you. The prophecy says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Zion, meaning the people of Israel. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on the foal of a donkey. I will take the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. This prophecy of Zechariah was given approximately 500 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Zechariah the prophet was giving this prophecy immediately after the Jewish people had been released from captivity by the Persians. If you know history at all, the, is, the people of Judah were taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Persians overran Babylon. And the long story short is that Cyrus the Persian decreed that the people of Israel should be released and returned to their homeland. So they were all there and they're building the temple and this prophet Zechariah arose and this is where the time frame where he gave this prophecy when Israel came back out of captivity and they're reestablished in the land. So in this prophecy, Zechariah was given insight as to how God was going to introduce the Messiah to the world. By Messiah, it's a Jewish word for meaning the Savior, or we call the Christ. Christ in Greek, Messiah in Hebrew. In the Mess Messianic prophecy, God reveals through Zechariah that this Messiah would come to God's daughter, Jerusalem. Now, God had established Israel as his nation that was to be the ambassador nation to the rest of the nations of the world. And his daughter, Jerusalem, would have a Messiah come to them, a Savior, a Christ that would come to them and would be established as their king. Jerusalem itself, the meaning of Jerusalem, means possession of peace. Possession of peace, that's the actual meaning of Jerusalem. What is significant is that in the ancient Middle Eastern world, Leaders rode horses if they rode to war, but they rode in on donkeys if they came in peace. See, the Pharisees and the zealots of the land, the religious leaders of that time, particularly the Pharisees and the zealots, they were looking for a military leader to be their Messiah with the same, men same mentality as, as King David. You see, King David was a mighty warrior in the physical realm. And he was the one who established the, the power of the nation at that time. And they dreamt with, of freedom from the Roman oppression so that they could return to being a power and that the Messiah would come in the form of King David. They wanted a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans and establish a new Israelite dynasty. Now the Sadducees were the, the chief priests and the Herodians, those who were with Herod, were happy with the way things were. They didn't want a Savior unless that Savior would play politics in league with them so that they could maintain their positions of power over the people. But Zechariah predicted that the Messiah would come to Jerusalem humbly, riding on the foal of a donkey. The Messiah would be righteous and he would be victorious over his enemies, but his victory would not be won with the weapons of man. The Messiah would not come to them in aggression to bring war horses and chariots and bows and arrows. The bow would be broken and the war horses and the chariots of Jerusalem and Ephraim would be taken out of the way. And if you recall, as I was just saying, that when Jesus went to hide, he hid in Ephraim. You see, what the promised prophecy given by Isaiah 
And it's all too familiar with many of us who've attended Christmas Mass or Christmas services in the past. In Isaiah chapter 9, 6, the promised Savior would be born as a man but would bring peace. As is written, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Isaiah prophesied that 700 years prior to the birth of Christ. Zechariah said this prince of peace would proclaim peace to the nations and his rule would extend from sea to sea, from the Jordan River to the ends of the earth. Although the entire world has been held in captivity to sin and the corresponding power of Satan, through Zechariah God promised that the blood of his covenant with them would free them from the, pit, from the prison of the waterless pit. In other words, God's Messiah would have a spiritual objective. He would come with a spiritual objective to free people from the penalty of sin, which is death in the pit of hell. Now, the day after the feast that Jesus attended in his honor for raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus decided that it was time for him and his disciples to go to Jerusalem in preparation of the Passover festival because the Passover festival was quickly approaching. Remarkably, in fulfillment of the prophecy given by Zechariah 500 years earlier from John chapter 12, verse 12, we start to read. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as was written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. As Jesus was riding into the into Jerusalem that day, you can picture it with the, the crowds of people who were all excited because Jesus, this man, or the, who, this prophet they considered, had raised this Lazarus from the dead, and he's coming and they, into the city. So they were laying down palm branches before him. And they're shouting, Hosanna! And Hosanna in English, like you've heard this maybe in church before, and you thought, what in the world does that mean? Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Doesn't mean anything in English. But in, in Jewish uh, times, in the ancient times, when someone shouted Hosanna, what they were shouting in Hebrew was, Save now, save now, save now. That's what they were shouting in Hebrew. Now, when they were waving the palm branches, the palm branches, the national symbol of Israel. Save now. Save Israel. Save us, O Lord. Save us, our God. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Blessed is the King of Israel. This is what they were shouting. They believed that as the, the son of David, Jesus was about to start a fantastic campaign that would culminate in a kingdom of revolt against the Romans. But he was starting out this way, just as Solomon had rode to his throne on a donkey, so Jesus was riding to his throne on a donkey. They desired Jesus to save them from the oppression that they're facing and usher them into God's messianic kingdom of peace. Apostle John writes about this as an eyewitness to what was happening in verse 17. And he says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people went because they had heard that he had performed this sign. They went out to meet him. But the religious leaders were watching. It doesn't say it in this gospel, but in other gospels, the religious leaders were telling Jesus' disciples, tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they're quiet, the rocks will cry out. 
They weren't happy. The religious leaders weren't happy to see the people praising God and lauding Jesus as their coming king. No, this Jesus was not at all like the king that they wanted him to be. In their minds, the king they wanted would have worked with them to build his kingdom in their image and what, after their design. So the Pharisees in verse 19 said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at how the whole world has gone after him. And rather than praising him and calling good leaders of the people to do the same, this Jesus of Nazareth who critiqued them and dared to call them a brood of vipers, no, he had to be put out of the way. He didn't support them in their positions. He was contradicting their traditions and making them look foolish in front of the people that they intended to lead. Every time they tried to trap him, Jesus would turn the tables. They were so excited about the Messiah, but they wanted a different kind of Messiah. And they were afraid that Jesus, coming in this peaceful presentation, some of them were afraid that Jesus would just raise the ruckus with the Romans. There was no army. Jesus didn't have an army with him. He was coming riding on a donkey's colt. They should have known. They knew the scriptures. They should have known that the king would come, the Messiah would come, riding on the foal of a donkey. But they, had, they were so blinded by their own interest that they didn't see it. So out of fear and hatred, they held up Jesus as a political threat. As just, and they made justification to have him killed. In verse 20 we read, Now there were some Greeks among those who went to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethesda, Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Bethsaida in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So this Passover festival that was held annually was a big deal. Okay, this is a far bigger deal than any festival that we hold in our culture presently. People from all over the place would pilgrimage into Jerusalem at that time, thousands of them. People from different parts of the world, Jews of different um, national uh, backgrounds they, that, that had been dispersed, they'd all gather in Jerusalem at this time. And there were some people at that time, Gentiles, that were what they would call proselytes. And, and a proselyte was a person that would... Um, that would, would come and, and, and follow the law of Moses even though they weren't an Israelite. They, would still, they were still convinced that Jehovah God was the God of the universe and the creator of the world, and they wanted to follow him even as Gentiles. So th that, that's what the, the scenario was here, that, that these guys were coming um, to Philip to inquire whether they could see Jesus because they had heard all the things that Jesus had been doing. Now, we're not told whether or not Jesus granted them an audience, but it's assumed that Jesus responded and likely responded to them being present as well. In verse 23, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. By the Son of Man, Jesus, has, he is called the Son of God. In, in saying Son of God, we mean God in the flesh, who has come down as a man and fully man. Fully God, fully man. Jesus is the sinless Son of God. He was born of a virgin, so he didn't have a sin nature like the rest of us do. Yet he was born of woman as fully a man. So the, son, the hour has come, Jesus said, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Well, glorification doesn't normally happen when someone is put to death. That's normally not how glorification takes place. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it, it dies, it produces many seeds. See, Jesus said this both about himself 
and about his disciples who would follow after him. He was telling those listening to him that the time was fast approaching when he would give his life as the Passover lamb of God. He would die to be multiplied in the lives of others just as a seed would never become a plant unless it's die, it dies and is buried. So the death and burial of Jesus were necessary for his glorification when he would rise from the grave conquering sin and death. As was prophesied by Zechariah, what we had read earlier, the new covenant through the shedding of the blood of the Messiah will rescue people from the waterless pit of hell. In exchange for death, Jesus brings eternal life to all who will believe and will follow after him. Jesus taught his disciples that for them to find eternal life, they would have to follow his examples and die, his example, and die to themselves. We read in Matthew chapter 16, 24 to 26, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You see, before there can be resurrection, power, life, and fruitfulness in our spirit, leading to everlasting life, our sinful nature that we're born with must be put to death. The cross represents a place where we die to ourselves. Before we can be true followers of Christ Jesus, we must come to the place where we willingly turn away from our life of slavery to sin and die to our old way of living. You cannot be a follower of Christ unless you are first willing to deny yourselves and to pick up your cross. The cross is the place where your death is to occur. You are to die to your old way of living. If there is no repentance and no turning away from the old ways of living, there is no salvation. Because the Lord God Almighty has decreed, those who love me will obey me. If you truly come to know Jesus, there will be a turning away from the old life. And it's not saying that you're going to be perfect. What it's saying is that your heart is going to be shifting gears because the Holy Spirit is in fact holy. And when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, He will change your perspectives. Old things will become new. You will no longer desire to follow after the ways that lead to death. But He will change you. This is what it's meaning when the Bible says, before you can enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You must be born of the water. When you're born in your mother's womb, and you must be born of the Spirit. And that can only happen if your sins are taken care of because the penalty of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. The old man is buried. And the Holy Spirit now comes in and brings new life. There is a death to self and a resurrection of life in the Spirit. And that's why Jesus said in our text this morning, reading from verse 25, that anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. We can't just cross our chest and clutch a rosary or bow our knee to an icon. That is not what God desires. God desires our heart to be given over to Him. And that means, God, I choose to surrender to You. Everything that I am and everything that I have, it belongs to You, O Lord. I choose to surrender. Give me strength, God, to do it because you can't do it on your own, but the Spirit of God will draw you to repentance and the Spirit of God will resurrect you to new life in Christ. And you can be a new creation in Christ today. If you've never come to this decision, 
God is calling you today. Put away your pride. Say, Lord, I need you. Jesus is the Savior, but Savior from what? You might ask. Savior from ourselves and everything that comes with that. To be a servant of Christ means to be a person that comes to the point that they recognize that Jesus is their creator and that their creator is not here to serve their purposes. Did you know that God's not here to serve your purposes? Did you know that? You're here to serve his. He is the king. We are not. He is the great I am. And regardless of what Molson Canadian says, I am, I am not. Your life is in the balance. You don't know from one day to the next whether you're going to draw another breath. Today could be the last day that you draw breath. The question is, are you ready? Because life is eternal. Whether you're in life, in paradise, in heaven with God, or you're in the waterless pit, it's up to you. God doesn't force anyone to follow him. He gives us a choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will you serve self, which leads to death, or will you serve Jesus, which leads to eternal life? This is a question that every person must ask themselves. If you love me, keep my commands, Jesus said in John 14, 15. After Jesus said, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. After he said that, he continues. The Lord's mind was turned towards the mission now that he was soon to fulfill. See, Jesus did come into the world to show us what God's like with skin on. He did. When you look at the teachings of Christ in the Gospels, when you look at those teachings, you see the glory of God through the pages as the power of God is displayed in the life and ministry of Christ. It's beautiful. But that was only part of the mission of Christ. The real reason he came was so that he could be the Passover lamb. And for those who aren't familiar with the Passover, the Passover is the celebration when Israel was in slavery to Pharaoh in Egypt. God called Pharaoh to let his people go, and he wouldn't. So on the night of the Passover, there was a series of plagues that were sent on Egypt so that they would let Israel go. On the night of the Passover, God instructed his people through Moses to make sure that they sacrificed a lamb and that the blood of the lamb would be placed over the doorpost entering their home. And that night, when God sent his wrath upon Egypt, wherever the angel would go that was bringing the wrath of God, whenever that angel saw the blood of the lamb applied to the threshold to that home, he would pass over it, and the wrath of God would pass over those who had the blood of the lamb applied to the threshold of their, of their family. Their, their home, their family home. And Jesus, you see, when John saw Jesus coming towards him, he said, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. God made himself flesh the creator of the universe humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross. Why did he do it? He's the creator of the world. He bows to nobody. He is the one who makes the rules. He is the one who spun things into existence. He did not have to come the way that he did, but he did because of his great love for people so that he could save people from their sins, so that he could be the Passover lamb whose blood would be shed, so that if your, your heart has the blood of the lamb applied to it, the angel of death passes over you and instead you are given life 
and freedom from slavery. That's what it's all about. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus said, in verse 27, because he knew that the entire burden of the world's sin would be placed upon his shoulders. He would be the sin bearer for the entire world. He said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven I have glorified it and will glorify. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The song has been sung in churches in the past. Lift Jesus higher, lift him up for the world to see. He says, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. It's not talking about our praise and worship lifting Jesus higher. It's talking about Jesus Christ being lifted up on the cross and being sacrificed for the sins of the world. If he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. I praise the Lord today that there are among us those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus because he was lifted up from the earth. His blood was shed and his Passover blood was applied to the threshold of my life and your life if you've accepted him. And because of this, the wrath of God passes over us. We are cleansed from our sins. We're given new life in Christ. The Holy Spirit takes residence in there. There is newness of life. If you've never made this decision before, I would encourage you. You can make this decision today. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Savior and, that, and, and you, you're willingly willing to walk away and say, Lord, I don't want to live the way I lived before. I want to live to please you. You turn your, 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 your back on your old way and you come to the cross. God will give you grace and he will save you by grace and he'll give you the strength to change and to be a new creation in the spirit. It's a promise. <sighs> See, the world was about to crucify the Lord of glory and life. Jesus being God in the flesh, he knew it would happen. But it was part of his grand design. It was part of his plan. That's why he said, no, it was for this reason that I came to this hour. He knew exactly what his mission was and what he was going to do. A sentence would be placed on the world, by the world on the creator in Jesus. A death sentence. A terrible rejection of the author of life and Messiah. Jesus was in the world, and though the world was created by him, the world did not recognize him. And Satan, the ruler of this world, and his scheme to keep mankind in captivity to the penalty of sin, was about to be shattered and driven out when Jesus sacrificed himself, when he willingly laid down his life by being lifted up on the cross, saving anyone who would place their trust in him for the penalty of their sins. The crowd spoke up. We've never heard from the law that the Messiah would remain forever. Or sorry, we've heard from the law that the Messiah would remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? They didn't understand what he was saying. Maybe you're confused with what you're hearing today. I pray that God would give you clarity. Jesus said to them in verse 35, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark doesn't know where they are going. Believe in the light while you still have the light so that you may become the children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, still they would not believe in him. This is the human heart. God can raise someone from the dead right in front of our eyes. And in our sin, we're blinded to the fact that it's God that's done this. And we turn our backs on it and we walk away as though he had never done anything. Doubt fills our mind and we justify it as being something that's not of him when it is. It's him. 
It's him. Lord, who has believed our message? You see, the next statement that Jesus makes is so sad. He says, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord, who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe, because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they can neither see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn and I would heal them. When the Lord presented himself to the nation of Israel, they rejected him. They rejected him time and time again. The majority of the people rejected him despite the fact that he did what he did, that he walked what he walked, that he rose Lazarus from the dead, that he made, he fed 10,000 people with a couple loaves and fish. It just never ceases to amaze how hard man's heart can become when they push away from the light. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Hear the word of the Lord. He's calling. He's calling to you. You see, the Israelites, over and over again, he came to them with the offer of salvation. They kept saying, no. No. You see, the more people reject and trample on God's offer of life through the gospel, the harder it becomes for them to receive it. When human beings close their eyes to the light because of disobedience and their love for their sin, God hardens them and makes it more difficult for them to see the light. And you can harden yourself to the point of no return until your heart is so wicked and hard that you will not understand your need for salvation. You will not repent from your sins. They're persistent. Re rejection of Jesus here, the religious leaders, is in fact the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And when you come to that point where you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, there's no forgiveness for that. The door closes. Friends, today is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice and the Spirit is stirring you inside, do not harden your heart. The more you reject the Lord, the more you harden your heart, the less you likely you are to submit to him. You'll drift and drift and drift and drift. This is why this is written here. Some of these guys that were listening to Jesus, can you imagine these religious leaders? Jesus had taken a man who was dead four days, raised him back to life. The people who studied the Bible and were in charge of the religious uh, ceremonies and all that, they wanted to kill him. For what? For being the prince of peace? For caring for a person and showing that he was the resurrection and the life to raise dead people back to life? They wanted to kill him for that because he didn't fit their idea of power that they thought the Messiah should be. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Verse 42, Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Then Jesus cried out. I want you to listen. If you don't listen to anything in this message today, outside of the next two paragraphs that I'm going to read from the Bible, please listen to what it has to say. Then Jesus cried out. Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. If anyone hears my words but not, does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. But there, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. For I did not speak on my own. But the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. 
I know that, this, that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. In him, Jesus, was life. And his life, the life, was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not understand it. See, we live in a world, by and large, with this message that I'm preaching right here, that is going to reject this message. But the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gives he the power to be the sons and daughters. That's what it means, sons of God. Children not born of natural descent, but born in the spirit. Children called after his name. Friends, we can rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ is creator of the universe. And that the king of kings came into this world the way that he did is wonderful. He came as a humble servant to save us because the world needs saving. From what? The world needs saving from the penalty of sin, which is death. The waterless pit. Zechariah prophesied about the Messiah doing just that, and this prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus Christ more than 500 years later. And this prophecy is continuing to be fulfilled today in those that place their trust in Jesus. There is salvation in no other name but Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You're not going to find salvation in your own device. You are not I am. You are not God. And you can devise any kind of plan that you want to save yourself, but you won't be successful because there is only one way to salvation. God himself provided that way. He came to die instead of you so that you wouldn't have to face the wrath of God because of your sin. Penalty of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. The love of God the Father for a sin-broken humanity was demonstrated when he sent God the Son into the world. What will you do with Jesus today? He took your sins upon his shoulders. The innocent Lamb of God took your sins upon his shoulders. Will you ask him to forgive you? Will you ask him to take away what separates you from him? This isn't just about fire insurance. This is not about fire insurance. It is, but it's not. Okay? Yeah, nobody wants to spend eternity separated from God in punishment. That's for sure. But it's so much more than that. The Son of God invites us to come to him to have a living, active, abundant life in relationship with him. The living God wants us to know him and the power of his resurrection. Because just as Jesus was raised from the dead, conquering sin and death, so there, therefore everyone who follows him will also be given victory over death. The eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And this is something that God desires everyone to experience because his love is great. Rejecting God's gift of salvation is rejecting the light of life and choosing eternal death instead of eternal life. If you're here today and you need salvation, join the club. We all need it. Have you experienced salvation with the Lord? Thank him this Thanksgiving for his gift of salvation. If you've never come to that point where you've surrendered your heart to him, you can do that today. And God will fill you with his Holy Spirit. 
And he'll take away your sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west, and you will have a new relationship with your creator that you never even dreamt possible. You see, thanksgiving is what it is because God has given us all these good things. And he's given us the best thing ever. And that is the opportunity to have a relationship with him. Would you pray with me today? Jesus, we come. And we acknowledge, God, that you are the Savior of the world. And thank you, God, for writing in your word all these things from the prophecy fulfilled to lives that are transformed. God, you've, you've recorded it. And God, we experience this. And I thank you. We thank you for, for those of us who believe today. God, we thank you for saving us, for taking away the penalty of our sins, for taking our sins away and putting your Holy Spirit within us. Thank you, Lord, for that. God, we pray that we would live a life worthy of the call. Our hearts are filled with gratitude to you today, Lord. For those that are here today, God, that maybe never have, maybe they just never understood the gospel or maybe they've never had the opportunity. Today, friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, he wants you to know him and the power of his resurrection. Today can be the day that you could give thanks to God for saving you and for giving you life in exchange for death. Would you surrender your heart to the Lord today? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, today can be the first day of the rest of your life. And that life doesn't just end here, it resonates into eternity. I'd like to talk to you if you want to make that decision. Or maybe you've come here today with someone who knows Christ. Maybe you're listening on the internet online here today and the Holy Spirit has cut you to the heart through the word that's been given. You can come to Christ. All it takes is a willingness to turn away and surrender to Christ and say, Lord, take me. I believe in you. Take my life. Save me. Save now, Hosanna. Save now, Lord. If you're here today and you want to make that decision, please don't put it off. You don't know what your future holds. You don't know if you're going to be alive another day. You could be alive for 50 years. But maybe tomorrow is the last day or today is the last day. Salvation has been offered by your Creator at a terrible price to Himself, I might add. Don't put it off. Ask Jesus to be your Savior today. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had together in this Thanksgiving day. God, I pray that your grace and peace would rest upon your servants in this place and that they would have a, a wonderful time with their families and friends. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen.